ready to pray with me? All right, let's pray. Father, you're so worthy to be praised. We're so grateful to be your daughters. We're so grateful to know that we have an inheritance that is from everything Jesus did from us, and now it's all going to be shared with us. We've been made wealthy because of you. And Lord, we're not only enjoying today because of our faith in you, but we're going to enjoy you for all of eternity, being your daughters, being loved, serving with you, and who knows what great exploits will come. But today we're here. Today we're in this world, and you have callings on our life, and you, you have talents that you've given us, and you want to use us. And so, Lord, I pray you take hold of this teaching to our hearts in a very personal way. I trust your Holy Spirit to speak and to tell each woman what you want them to hear and that your word, Lord, that will not to return void will do a work in us and would cause us to grow. So speak, have your hand on me, Lord. Help me, please, Father, I need you. And I want to thank you for tonight and that we can be here opening your word together. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Open up to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. We'll start in verse 14. So Matthew 25, verse 14. Put your finger on that. I want to explain a little bit about this parable before we dig into it. Matthew 25, starting in verse 14. All right. Now, the parable of the talents that we're going to be studying tonight is arranged in Matthew just after the parable of the ten virgins. The theme of the parable of the ten virgins is be ready for the Lord's return. And the parable of the talents teaches us what we ought to be doing and what readiness looks like. This is what we should be doing before he returns. So the parable of the ten virgins reveals what it looks like to wait on the Lord as before he returns. But the parable of the talents shows us what holy doing and holy living is like. This is not a coincidence, of course, the Lord just to pose these two so that he could bring home a brilliant point to us that the Lord is coming soon. And if you read the signs of the times, everything that's happening on our earth, in the world, it is signs that Jesus' return is soon. Then you know that we need to be effectively and faithfully using all of the talents that he has given us. So let's begin by reading Matthew uh, 25, 14. Just the very first part of that. For the kingdom of heaven is like, and I'm going to stop right there. For the kingdom of heaven is like, in the book of Matthew, he uses that phrase some 32 times. And every time we read that phrase, for the kingdom of heaven is like, or the kingdom of God is like, we want to have our minds alert. We want to have our minds ready because God is going to bring forth a valuable eternal truth to us at that point. And we can anticipate a revelation from him about how things work and operate in God's economy. Now, the word economy here means under God's um, sovereign rule or his management. Through the use of this parabolic illustration or a parable, God will depict his divine perspective to us, explaining how things operate in his sovereign rule. So simply put, the kingdom of heaven is like, could be read, the, this is how things work in God's kingdom. And though with a parable, you can't take everything absolutely literal, it's an illustration, yet we will gain so much knowledge into what God's kingdom is like, how he sees things, how he wants things done, and so we're about to do that right now. Verse 14, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his servants and delivered his goods to them. Verse 15, and to one he gave five talents and to another two and to another one to each according to his own ability and immediately he went on his journey. Okay, a wealthy man makes plans to go abroad in order to keep his business running and keep it in operation, he calls his servants to take an active role in managing his money. There were three servants. Each was given a different sum. 
To one he gave five talents, to another he gave two, to another he gave one. A talent is a weight. That meaning of talent is actually a weight. It's used in coins um, from ancient Greece, from Rome, and mid the Middle East. Now, the value of that coin would depend on what it was made of. If it was made of copper, it'd be a little less. Silver, it'd be a little more. And if it was of gold, it'd be the highest value. The important point about a tal talent is that it represented a, a large sum of money, a very large sum of money to be trusted to these men. And each were to invest that money so that it would appreciate. In other words, it would increase. And so they were to manage it by investing it in some way, and then they would make their boss a profit. Every boss likes a profit. So interestingly, it's noted that each man was distributed a, a, a talent according to his own individual ability. And that speaks to me that the, this boss knew his employers very well. He, under, he knew his servants' abilities. He had watched them. They'd probably been tested somewhat up to this point. And now he's saying, I know you have the ability to be responsible for five. I trust your ability to be responsible for two and you for one. All of these, these individuals had ability. He saw that in them. And so he doled that money out to them based on his knowledge of who they were. And so the word ability here is the word deutimus. We use that word for power when we're empowered of the Holy Spirit. But it is also just used in regular power, strength, and might that an individual might have. But even to define it more clearly in the Greek, it means possession of the means or skills to do something. Possession of the means or skills to do something. So they, each one had ability. They had the skill and the means to do something. It means potential in functioning in some way, and it means capability. In this case, no specific instructions were given to the servants. They were left to their own initiative in how to invest this money in order to make a profit. The expectation of each individual was different he didn't look at each one and say, I expect the same thing. I've given you different numbers of talents. Therefore, I expect there to be different results. Isn't that kind of nice to know that God sees that about us? He's given us such different amount of talents and different kinds of talents, and he's expecting different results. And I don't know about you, but huh, I don't have to be like everybody else or keep up with someone else. And some of these women are just too talented, I think. Some women just get so many. They're definitely five talented people. <laughs> and I'm so jealous of them, except that with a talent comes responsibility, right? <laughs> Everyone with talent has a responsibility. But I love that God has looked at us individually and has determined, knowing us, what, what's best to give to us. He isn't giving us more. He isn't giving us less. It's just right. So he entrusted a sum to each one of them with a both a fair and wise plan for each of them individually, and he's leaving it to them to do their best with it. Let's go to verse 16. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded them with them, they traded with them, and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more talents. But he who had received one went and dug in a hole and hid his Lord's money. So after this man departed, the servant with five talents immediately went to work seeking to profit what he was given. We know that it was immediate because of the word then. Verse 16, then he who had received five. And, and it was really the same even with the second one because likewise he did the same. That word then can be translated at once. He did waste no time. He took what he was given and he went to work with it immediately. This shows the servant's industriousness. He was diligent, he was hardworking, and he was very faithful to his master. He decided to trade his talent, and by this effort, he made five more talents. So he doubled his money. We aren't told how he traded it. Perhaps he took that money and um, loaned it at interest to someone and was able to get that money back. Perhaps he used the money and he bought things with it. And then he sold those items and he was able to get it, uh, some extra money back and earn interest. We're not told. Uh, but the point is, is that he took what he was given. And over time, because remember, the master was gone quite a while, he invested it well and he doubled it. Likewise, 
Servant number two did the exact same thing. We saw that he doubled his two so that he had four. He also was diligent, hardworking, and faithful. Now the last servant dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. He didn't lose it. At least he retained it. <laughs> but there was no profit either. And what was the master looking for, ladies? Increase, profit, right? And so his was an equivalent to a loss. Now, I'm going to go through verses 19 through 23. Um, the t first two servants in this will be judged. In other words, they will give an account for the, their efforts with their talent. So starting in verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five talents more besides them. Verse 21, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Verse 22, and also he who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you master over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So time passed. The, the, they brought an account to their master. They had plenty of time to work with this money and, and bring increase. And they did. Each of them doubled their increase. And each of them were rewarded. They were commended and each one was also promoted because of their good labors. Um, he, the, the master offered praise to them and commendation saying, well done, good job. I like what I see here, right? And that always feels good. When someone you respect tells you well done, it's like that means a lot when, when you hear that. And, but in what way had they done well? Well, it's discovered in the phrase, good and faithful. He's describing attributes that he saw within them that he was praising and saying, I like this. You were good and you were faithful. So those were the attributes that this master praised. Our father praises those attributes as well. Good means honest. Didn't rip him off. He was ethical in the way he handled his business. Conscientious, being very careful and wise and in fulfilling service. So honest, ethical, conscientious, in fulfilling service is good. Faithful means dependable and trusted so as to be relied on. I can count on you. You follow through. And as a reward for their faithfulness over the talents given them, the master gives them a promotion. You have been faithful over a few things. This little, this was large sums of money, but what I've given you, you've been faithful with, I will make you ruler over many things. I gave you an opportunity to oversee this sum of money. Now I'm going to make you an overseer. I'm going to put you over and make you responsible as a ruler over other people. In other words, you will actually be the ruler of other individuals. And so they're promoted to management, basically. Isn't that amazing? He was very pleased with their work. Ruler literally means to be put in charge, to appoint one to administer an office. So this, these excellent managers did well with their talents. And because of this, they were entrusted with greater and more to oversee. And then he says something to them very special. He says, enter into the joy of your Lord. This part really blessed me this week as I was studying it. And I don't know, I felt like the Lord spoke to me in a way I hadn't heard before. In this concept, we see that the, the master himself experiences great joy in his work. Enter into the joy, look, enter into the joy of your Lord. It's his joy, right? Enter into the joy that I already have in the work that I do. He relishes it. He loves what it produces. It's his joy to be about it. And so now the master invites them to be more involved into the good works that the Lord is doing. 
so much so that they will now work alongside him and be more closely, intimately connected with him, involved in all he's doing, and that now they're going to experience the joy along with him. Whoa, baby, do you hear what God is saying? Hey, you're, when you're faithful, I'm going to invite you into my joy. I'm going to let you be closer, proximity, working side by side with me even more. I'm going to entrust more to you. I'm going to talk to you more. I'm going to guide you more. I'm going to help you more. We're going to be involved in this joy together. Isn't that the most exciting thing? And I can say that it is because when I serve the Lord, it's the best. It is the best. So... This was a considerable joy. And so it goes with the Lord for us. Remember that as we look at the responsibility that we will see in serving. But understand that as you step in to the more he gives you, as you're faithful with whatever talents he gives you, he will give you more. And you're going to receive the best thing of all, closeness with him. And seeing the joy he sees when he works in lives. It's the best place, it's the best seat in the house to see him working and operating in people's lives and you being participant of it, the best. Now, how was the man who was given one talent judged? What, what account was made there? Verse 24. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. The third man begins to make excuses for what he did with his one talent and how he handled it. And sadly of all, he blames his master. He's saying it's because of who you are. It's your personality problem. It's your temperament. You know, it's your character. Because of your character, that's, that's all I could do with it. He, his valuation of his boss was that he was hard, mean, harsh, stern, and intolerable. That's what he said. I was afraid of you, he said. And I went and hid the talent in the ground. He says in there, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. Do you know what he's really saying here? He's saying, you are a man who expects the impossible of his servants. Because you didn't sow there and you didn't reap there and yet you're expecting me to profit, bring a profit. He's saying, what you expect of me is impossible. And then he said, I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. The servant's skewed and faulty view of his master fostered a great fear of him. Not the kind of fear that's based on respect or esteem of an authority, uh, but the kind of that, fear that's due to disrespect and even contempt of your master or your boss. Believing he would not receive grace in his ventures from this man, his master, he gave up before he ever began, which produced a failure of fruitlessness. All the servant could produce was what was given to him to begin with. Again, it was a loss. Verse 26, and, the, and his master is now going to give his judgment. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own, my own with at least some interest. You wicked and lazy servant. Oh, that hurts. The servant made his excuses, but the master identifies the true issue, the true problems of this servant. Wicked, you're wicked. That means bad or evil in nature. And then you're lazy. Laziness is sluggishness, lagging behind, idle, or inactive. In his wickedness, we want to understand where his wickedness lies. It lies in his laziness. He's wicked because he's lazy. And he didn't take what he could do with that talent and make the most of it. He didn't take the abilities that he had and use those abilities to bring profit. 
And he was wicked because he entertained these thoughts and he brought a false accusation against his master. That was his wickedness. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered. The point isn't that the man's thinking about the master was accurate at all. It's easy to read that in there and think, oh, so that is the way this master really was. No, but that was the thinking of the man. You knew it, you thought it, you believed it, right? You believed that. So that was his thinking. If you really believed your master was going to condemn you and be harsh and strict on you, wouldn't you have doubled and tripled your efforts? Wouldn't you have really worked hard to get the most out of those talents? But what was his response? Nothing. He did nothing. And so he made no effort whatsoever. 27. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back with my, back my own with interest. That was the least he could have done. Now, we're about to sink into the parable principle. Um, it begins in verse 28, and it applies to all of us in kingdom thinking. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For, for to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. So take the one talent that you did nothing with and give it to the most trustworthy of the servants. Surely he will use it to its fullest advantage. The principle, everyone who is faithful with what the Lord gives them, much more will be given to them to oversee. Much more will be entrusted to them. Everyone who is unfaithful with, with what the Lord gives them to work with, even that will be taken away. That one who is an unfaithful, lazy, um, you know, evil-hearted servant, he will forfeit opportunity, amazing opportunity to serve his master. And verse 30 goes on to say, and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, verse 30, there's typically two ways of interpreting it. I'm going to share both of them. One is that the unprofitable servant is an unsaved man. He's not prepared for the Lord's coming, and it's seen in his absolute inaction, right? Can you kind of picture that? David Gusick comments two things. Just as there was a sense of heaven in the destiny for the two faithful servants, there is a strong sense of hell in the destiny for the wicked and lazy servant. In the larger context of Matthew 25, the main point of the parable is clear. Our readiness for Jesus' return is determined by our stewardship of our resources that he has given us. So that was his thought. Now, number two is that the unprofitable servant is a saved man who makes no use of what the Lord has assigned to him. That weeping and gnashing of teeth would represent sorrow and regret for the wasted opportunities of his life. Warren Wearsby comments, some feel that this unprofitable servant was not a true believer, but it seems that he was a true servant even though he proved to be unprofitable. The outer darkness of Matthew 25, 30 need not refer to hell, even though it is often called that in the case of the Gospels. It may be dangerous to build theology on parables, for parables illustrate truth in vivid ways. The man was dealt with by the Lord. He lost his opportunity for service and he gained no praise or reward. To me, he says, that is outer darkness because he did not receive praise or reward. That is outer darkness. So either way you interpret the ending of this parable, one thing is clear. The Lord would have his servants use every resource that he gives them your talents, your abilities, your spiritual gifts, your positions, your time, your money, your education, everything he gives you in order to produce a profit for the kingdom of God and for his glory. Sound good? Making sense? I want to share with you five main points in order to encourage you and exhort you to be faithful servants. Number one, 
We are stewards. A steward. A steward manages the resources of another. Just as we are to manage the resources the Lord gives to us. Those resources are given to us to do some kind of kingdom work. Remember, this story isn't about the world and the earth and making life great for us here. It has to do with our service, a kingdom work for the Lord, because that master represented the Lord and those servants were serving him, correct? And so understand that. We are meant to take the things the Lord has given us and use them for his kingdom. The second service, the, the um, second servant, what was I going to say here? The second a good servant didn't invest, or the third really, didn't invest in, um, the way he should at all. He did nothing with his. But notice that the first two, they didn't invest in something to profit themselves. They didn't take their master's money and say, here, now let me go out and buy myself a new car, or a new house, or a new wardrobe, right? The things that they did was to profit their master. And that's very important as we go through this teaching to understand the things that we're talking about that are given to us by the Lord are meant to profit his kingdom in some way. All right. That means that in some way we would be benefiting the kingdom of God, his church, or the people of this world that he loves so dearly. That's what we're supposed to use our talents for. Kingdom work, blessing the church, blessing the world so that they could know him because they are dear to him. Okay, two. This one's a little longer because it's got little points under it. But listen, if we're going to, to, to move forward and use our talents more thoroughly and more faithfully, we need to assess what was given to us to begin with. <laughs> what talents do we have? We need to take a hard look at what we've been blessed with and then determine if we're using them for the Lord the way he would want us to. We have to ask ourselves, Am I using these gifts and talents and abilities the way God would want me to? And then prayerfully make adjustments if needed. So let's consider some, some gifts and talents and abilities, um, things that we have in common, all of us in this room, some things that we've all been given from the Lord. The first one is time. Time. We all have been given life. It's measured in seconds in minutes, in hours, in days, in weeks, in months, and years. Some of you have been given a great deal of time already. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and some of you just a little bit of time. Looking at one of my friends back there, or one of our younger members, we all got a few of you. But yet, we've been given time. And time is something that we will be held accountable for. When we reach that judgment, when he, we, he looks at all of our good works to see if they're, they're made of, you know, wood, hay, and stubble, or all the gorgeous, beautiful stuff that will remain. And so time is a gift from God. And we want to use all of our seconds to glorify him. So much of our time is wasted. Am I, is that true? Yes. It's, just, it's just honest. While we don't have to be legalistic about our time, because that could be horrible to live like that, counting every second, many of us could make adjustments of the way we use our time so that we can accomplish things of more importance, especially things of eternal value. So let me encourage you. Assess what time in your life is just wasted. It's, it's really has no value to it. It's just a time sucker and weed that out. Evaluate the commitments that you already have in your life because commitments are the things that take up our time. You have to uh, accomplish essentials in life. Everybody needs to sleep. Everybody needs to clean their house. Everybody has to do whatever work you're called to do. And, you know, you want to spend time with their family. Nobody's saying get rid of these things. But ask yourself in your commitments, have I also set time apart to serve the Lord? Is that a real part of my life? Because that's kingdom business. Am I doing good for others? Check your commitments. Is, is there regular time I'm spending doing good for others? After that, plan and schedule. That's part of managing time, right? Plan and schedule. These are invaluable tools for time management. Some of us just like to roll through life. I am naturally one who likes to roll through life. Like if I could have it my way, if I ever were retired, which just doesn't really seem real to me, but if I ever were, um, 
that I would just naturally be like that. Go to bed when I want, wake up when I want, do what I want, you know. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't live life in a rush. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be all scheduled out the way I am now. I'm scheduled out like crazy. But that's so I can accomplish kingdom purposes. That is not my natural bent at all. I just do it because I want to serve the Lord. And I've got to fit it in, so I've got to be super organized. It, wanting to serve the Lord has, has forced me to organize myself so that I can be more available to his things. And so maybe you need to do that. Maybe you need to plan and schedule more. I challenge you to remove one or two things that are time wasters in your life. Just get rid of it. It might even just be a, one TV show that like, I'm not going to watch this, so I'm going to have an extra hour in my life, right? I challenge you to do that. And then commit to one responsibility or uh, any kind of commitment that has eternal value to it. In some way, that's going to be a blessing to God's kingdom, to a blessing to or to a blessing to God's uh, church, or to others in the world who need Jesus. I hope you'll take this challenge, and I would love to hear what God does in your life when you do that. So we've got to use our time wisely. It's precious. It's going fast. <laughs> it's going real fast at this point in my life. Use it for the Lord's glory. Then how about money? We've all been given some money in our lives and money represents potential for good potential for good since all the money we have has been given us by the lord we should invite him to guide us in how it's spent we should seek him and so i want you to keep these kind of questions in mind as you seek him about your money is your money wisely and carefully spent or are you frivolous and in indulgent we talked a little bit about that last week do you budget? Budgeting is not old-fashioned. <laughs> it's something that we should be doing today because budgeting is managing your money and it shows you where all of your money is going and it will reveal so much to you of where you're wasting money and where you are being frivolous. And it hold, holds you accountable to use that money wisely. Back when I was young, I had those envelopes, like the envelope. Have, anybody do the envelopes back in the day? <laughs> And, you know, and uh, it would be here's what it costs. And every week, here's some money for our, our rent. Here's some money for our food. Here's some money for gasoline. Here's our tithe money. You know what I mean? We, when he had envelopes and we'd fill them and fill them. Here's our entertainment money. We knew exactly where our money was going. And now my husband does all that and he does it on the computer. So we know where money gets wasted. We can plan for the future more wisely. So do you budget? Are you holding yourself accountable for the money you're spending? You're taking responsibility for the provisions God's given you. Is some of your money being used to make a difference? This could be used, I mean, any way. But our money should be used to make a difference. It, remember, this money, all the money we have isn't just meant to make our life comfortable and cushy and satisfying. These are God's money, and it should be used to make a difference. And then is some of your money being used, used for God's kingdom or God's work? You know, there's so many ways, it's endless ways that we can give to God's glory. Money is a talent that we will all give a, account for on that day. Let's go into our talents and abilities. Talents and abilities are seen in a sense in the natural realm because we're really all given certain talents and abilities when we're born. Maybe, you know, someone's mechanically inclined or they're super artistic or creative. Uh, some people are so good with numbers. God bless you because I hate numbers. And that means, you know, they, you people help me a lot. Some are just super intelligent. They have amazing minds. Others are so compassionate. And they just, the way they love people and care for people and nurture them is just beautiful. It's, the list is endless, but these are things that every person, whether they're a Christian or not, have been given. But then there's also spiritual talents and callings that God gives us, spiritual gifts that he wants us to use. And those are, you know, used here on earth, um, but they're used for God's glory in the spiritual realm. But whether it's from the natural or from the, the spiritual realm, all of these are God-given propensities which drive us into serving and doing things in the direction God is calling us to, right? Right? If he gives you creativity, if he gives you, uh, you know, use for numbers, if, if he, you know, gives you something like that, it's meant to push you in a direction to be used because he's given it to you for his use. And so, um, you know, 
all of our abilities, whether it's natural or whether it's sp spiritual, like if you have a spiritual gift, uh, if God's called me to teach, it, it doesn't matter. It's still like a muscle. It has to be used. It has to be trained. It has to be stretched. It has to be strengthened to perform at its highest potential and its best fruitfulness. It has to be used. So these men were given talents, and now you have five, and you've worked that muscle, right? And you used it, and you doubled that. Now I'm going to give you more. Now you've got you to keep working in the sense of wanting to get better and better at whatever gift you've been given. So I want to throw these questions at you. What are your natural talents? What are your spiritual gifts and abilities? What gifts has the Lord given to you to operate in? Is there a particular calling on your life? Something that you are doing now or like it's, it's always sort of been there, this heart's desire, this yearning um, to accomplish something that could make a difference. Uh, maybe the Lord's put a burden on you for that. Um, often um, there's a, there could be a sign through these, these abilities that come out that tell us, go in that direction. It's a calling from God. Do you use your talents, your abilities, these things that God has brought into your life just to bless yourself? We have to keep asking ourselves this hard question. Is everything I'm doing in life really just for me and for my family and the circle of people I care about? Or is the, are the gifts and talents that I've been given going out to others? Because they were never all meant to be for us. They were meant to be given out to others. So are you supporting God's work? Um, do you sense that you've reached your God-given potential? Like, I have reached it. I'm right where God wants me to be. I'm as strong and spiritually refined. I am using my gifts to their highest potential. If not, have you made an effort to increase your skills and to better yourself so that you're even more usable for the Lord? If not, how might you accomplish that? That's food for thought for every one of us. How might I take that potential and grow it for God's glory? So I'm even more usable. Now, when I was studying this, what came to mind is a gal in our fellowship called Judy Irwin. She's an amazing lady. She's our resident artist and art teacher. Judy took up art later in life. Um, she dabbled with it on her own. Then she got a little training um, in it as well. Um, but it was something that personally brought her delight and enjoyment and pleasure, something she liked. She took the opportunity to even sell some of her art and get it out there, you know, which is a really brilliant thing for her to do. But God had a greater and sweeter plan for Judy's gifts. Judy took her gifting and this passion she has for it um, and generously offered it to the Lord. Simply when a woman said, would you teach me how to toll paint? And Judy said, sure. And let's invite some other ladies too. And before you know it, an art class developed. Judy gave her talents back to the Lord so fully that she organized her life around this service. She set a day aside. She cleans her house. <laughs> she, she chooses the projects her class will do. It's, it's very organized. It's very productive. On Facebook, each time they have a class, I see some of their artwork on there. And I mean, I've been able to even watch women develop in their giftings, Karen. Amazing. You know, just so many. It's, it's mind-blowing. It's so productive and so fruitful. Not only are people learning to do their art, they're fellowshipping in the Lord. They're encouraging each other in the Lord. They're supporting each other. It's become a ministry. That's pretty stinking amazing, right? But there's more. Last spring, Judy's class of about 12 women painted up a storm painting watercolor landscapes for our women's conference, providing over 160, well over, almost 170 individual, unique works of art for every woman in attendance of our conference to take home as a gift. And they gifted us these gifts free of charge. That is how you multiply a gifting. That how you, is how you take something God has given you and you make it and you maximize it to the most. Well done, Judy. That is amazing. 
the same pattern, the same concept of growth will occur in all modes of our talents and giftings and callings. True, our talents may not all become, you know, Picassos, <laughs> you know. We may not completely master to the highest level in our giftings and talents of other, like as others do. For instance, you know, I'm not going to be Anne Graham Watts. Darn it. And I'm not going to be Beth Moore. You know, I'm not bitter. <laughs> but the great thing is, is that that's okay. Because I take the talents I have and fulfill the callings God has for me and do his kingdom work. So much depends on what the Lord gives you how he calls you, and also the efforts and the time you invest. It, it, it's a cooperation, isn't it? He gives us the talents, and we invest, and we work at it. Not a work so that he's pleased with us or to be accepted by him, but we work at it because we want to bring him glory. So it brings me to an important point, and this is point number three. Don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. Proverbs 15, 19. The way of the lazy man is like a hedge of thorns, but the way of the upright is a highway. This scripture reveals the attitude is the problem, not the aptitude. It's not that, that these two men, the lazy and, and the upright, don't have the same advantage. It's that one has an attitude problem and the other doesn't. So the lazy man makes excuses why he can't get things done, why life is so hard for him, and, you know, everything goes wrong for me. My life is hedged with thorns. You don't understand. That's why it's so bad. But the diligent person gets it done. He doesn't give up, and she doesn't give up because of hardships and obstacles and trials. They push through letting their talents flourish, and then it's like his life is a highway, smooth sailing, right? He's leaving the lazy man way in the dust, like a highway. It's the attitude, not the aptitude. Now, to be clear, being lazy does not mean you cannot have a day of rest, you can't go have fun, you, you know, of course not. We don't want to get this like work ethic in the Lord that we got to keep going, we got to keep going, you know, then that way we'll please him. But we do want to be faithful and diligent. We do want to be hard working. But yes, we're allowed to rest. But being lazy describes the attitude that's perpetuated by a person who does not make wise use of their time, whose ethic is devoid of value of hard work. They don't want to work hard, flat out. Laziness describes someone who's been given talents to do God's work, but doesn't care about being productive, doesn't want to be industrious, doesn't care to be fruitful. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest is their MO. Take the easy path, Proverbs 24, 33. We can be lazy at school. We can be lazy at work. We can be lazy within our home. Is this the characteristic that you want to define you? Is this the characteristic you want to define your work for the Lord? Laziness? Let us follow the exhortation of Romans 12, verse 11, which says, Let us not allow laziness or negligence to spoil our work. Rather, be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Be fervent in spirit, which means be eager and enthusiastic about all that you do for the Lord. I know that soon I am going to be at my house every day, going through every inch of it, cleaning out every piece of garbage and junk and paper and, oh my gosh, and then my garage, you know? And I, I mean, I have, thank God he's given me time. I've been praying for months about this because I would feel like I am going to be depressed I'm going to be miserable. I'm just going to be a very unhappy person because I'm not getting to do the thing I love. But yet, it is my responsibility and my calling. That's part of my faithfulness, right? And so I've been praying, and it's funny. As I've been praying and giving it to the Lord, I'm actually excited now. I actually can see, like, this is going to be amazing. My house is going to be so squeaky clean. I'm going to be able to invite people over and feel great about it. <laughs> when I move, 
I'm not moving all this garbage with me. I'm going to have a fresh start. And I am excited about it now. I had to pray about that a lot to get there, though. I just want you to know. And maybe you need to pray about these kind of things, too, and ask God to give you a whole overhaul in the way you view things. We need a new perspective sometimes. So here's some points about being lazy. If you are lazy, confess it to the Lord as sin. Ask him to help change your heart. And then consider a few of these suggestions if they fit. Typically, a lot of lazy folks don't have a set bedtime or wake-up time. They just roll through life. I want to encourage you, if you want to move out of laziness, set a bedtime and go to bed. Set a wake-up time and wake up. Use the alarm to help you rise. It's very simple, but it's very important to begin your life as a schedule organized way. Productive people, ask them. They organize their days <laughs> in order to be more available for the things that are in front of them. Then also, create a weekly plan or a weekly list of what you want to do, what you need to accomplish. Write everything down that you can think of, and then cross it off as you go. You could do this digitally nowadays, or you could do it a, with a hard copy. Maybe you would want to get a day planner. I actually keep mine just on my personal uh, document in my computer. And I mean, I keep months and months worth of things, so all my appointments are on there. But every day, literally, girls, every day, what it is I'm going to be doing that day is there. If I want to get the dishes done, I write it down. <laughs> Seriously, if I've got an appointment, it's on there that I'm going to study, that I have Bible study in the morning and I have Bible study at night. I know I, I, I have those things, but they are on there. And the feeling of crossing it off is awesome. I just really get off on that. <laughs> I need encouragement and I feel accomplished. It feels good knowing I've done what I needed to do. And so I just encourage you to, to really, if, if, that, if that might help you, make it a habit of your life. Set an alarm to be on time. A lot of lazy people are, are late. Maybe you're one of those girls who everyone tells you be there an hour earlier before the event even starts because they know you're going to be an hour late. Did you know that being late is very disrespectful? It's very disrespectful to the time of others. Everybody has a moment that they're late, you know, don't get me wrong. But to make that a practice habitual in your life is very disrespectful, and it's a very selfish. In other words, my time is what matters. I'm here when it's comfortable, for, convenient for me. I don't care about your time. Set an alarm. Do what you must. Organize your life. I'll tell you one of the things I do. I choose my clothes before Sunday morning. Before Monday morning, I know what I'm going to wear. I know. I sound, dare I use the word anal? <laughs> I don't know that that's biblical. <laughs> It sounds like it, and it's just, you don't even know how weird it is that I'm like this, because this is not what I am like naturally, but it's what I do to serve the Lord. It's what I've turned into this woman so that I could accomplish more for him, and it's helped me. And so organize your life, plan, put what you need by the front door, choose what you're going to wear, you know, just make it easier for yourself to get out of that door. And then I want to say to you, Build new habits. Just simply build new habits. If you're lazy, try making, after you've eliminated some of your time wasters, try making a new commitment to serve, to work, or to accomplish something and see it through to the end. Like, maybe you just need to clean your pantry. Make that your goal. Set time in your schedule for it. You don't have to do that all in one shot. Just get a, you know, work for 30 minutes, work for an hour, and whatever you get done, you're done. Then choose, maybe next week you'll work at it again. But try to build new habits, you know, because this is called investing, right? It's called increasing and being more profitable. Okay, number four, be faithful and diligent. This is real short, but listen, be faithful and diligent. Show up, follow through, keep your word, Work hard. Go beyond, above and beyond expectations. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Do you understand? It said, whatever you do, not just when I'm serving at church, 
Whatever you do, do it for the Lord. I tell you, this is going to make you be so much more profitable when you're aware that everything you're doing is unto him, it's for him, it's for his glory, it's for his pleasure. And you will see much more excellence come from your life. Teach that to your children while they're young so that they will become these kind of faithful and diligent servants. And then lastly, I just want to say to any of you who feel like I'm barely getting to know what my gifts are, I'm unsure of my callings, I want to encourage you to step out. That's number five. Step out. Try things that are new so that you can discover what you're good at, what interests you, and especially to find that sweet spot where when you're doing it, you feel the grace of God. You feel the help of God. You know that he's actually, you know, lifting you into that place or that service or that calling or that position, and that it's sweet. When you're doing it for the Lord and you, you know that he's in it, you know that, that you're able to do beyond what you could do on your own. And so look for that. Step out. But you've got to try things. I've tried so many things and failed, you guys. You wouldn't believe it, but there are things that I was told, I'm sorry, Vanita, we, we, we prefer you don't do this anymore. That is right. It has happened to me. Um, we don't think this is your gifting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no one would believe it, but believe it. It is true. And it's the best thing that could ever happen. It, God guides you that way. It's okay to find out you're not successful at one thing or another and go, I, and I hate doing this. Like, God isn't going to force you into doing every last thing you hate except the dishes and things at home, you know. <laughs> Sometimes we have to do those. So find that, that thing that you find his grace in and he, he, you feel that sense of his, his calling and help in, and that's your sweet spot right there. But you also have to try things to discover what you hate <laughs> and what you have no talent for. So I've learned it's important to step outside of my comfort zone and to, to step out in faith. This is a faith in the Lord to be challenged with something that I'm not accomplished at, that I'm not accom accom accustomed to, that I know is beyond me. And these challenges, I say to you by my experience, have allowed me to see what the Lord can do through me. I can't do it, but what the Lord can do operating through me. Because I've done this, I can honestly say my life has been amazing. It has been awesome. Because... He's brought me into his joy. He's brought me in. And I get to see more works that I wouldn't have seen if I just stayed on the sideline. I wouldn't see how he's transformed lives. I wouldn't see women changing their attitudes, their opinions, uh, being forgiven, forgiving others. I wouldn't see them transform. I wouldn't see marriages healed. I wouldn't see so much. I wouldn't see an event start a, sc a scratch on paper one little idea and a whole event <laughs> come to pass. And all of that, it's not all of that. What's exciting, it's the presence of God in it and seeing him do a whole operation I cannot accomplish. It is beautiful to enter into the joy of the Lord. But not only that, as we do this, as we step out in faith, try new things, see where our gifts and talents are, try to hone those gifts and cause them to grow, pray about that, but in the end, we're rewarded here. I, I feel rewarded. Do you feel rewarded by your service to the Lord? There's rewards here. But all the rewards in eternity that will be waiting for us when he will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord is going to be the best words we could ever hear. Is that your desire? Take this seriously. This is a word from the Lord. This, this passage that we're studying, he wants us to grow. He wants to give us more. He's given you whatever talents you have now, but he's like, oh, please be faithful. Oh, how I long to use you. Let's pray. We are in awe of your kingdom plan for us, that you would invite us in to be part of your plan is incredible. Thank you for the gifts, the talents, the abilities, the time, the money, all that you've given to us, Lord. Thank you. You've been so generous. Lord, we, we just, we want to offer it back to you. We've been stingy at times. We've been lazy at times. We've been 
unwise, even unwilling. But Lord, would you do a new work in us? Would you revive our heart toward you, toward your kingdom work, toward things of eternal value? Would you help us to not just live for ourselves and our own comfort and pleasure and then for that small circle of the ones that we love, but could we just be those who give our lives away to be used with people who don't know you, who need to know you, to be used in our church, to be used, Lord, for your service. We pray, Father, that you just speak to us individually, that you would show us personally what we need to hear from this study, and God, empower us to literally apply it. We will give you all the praise, all the glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. All right. Enjoy your groups, ladies.